Welcome to the Walsh Literacy Initiative's Rita Palooza. In this session, we proudly welcome Dr. Louisa Motes. Louisa Motes, and I have a few minutes to share some thoughts with you about the role of higher education in the preparation of teachers and the potential at Walsh University for really bringing science uh, to the art of teaching. Uh, this is a cartoon developed by Carolyn Cowan that depicts our current dilemma in education, and that is the chasm between a body of research that actually has existed for about 50 years and the practices that are popular in our classrooms and what we're striving to do and Walsh's going in the right direction as far as I know, is bridge this chasm and both um, enable teachers to study the science of reading, but also enable teachers to apply and practice the best ideas with a knowledge base that informs everything we do. As everyone knows, we do have a problem and we wouldn't be talking about improving teacher education unless we had this chronic evidence that a large proportion of kids in our country and in our schools are not learning to read as well as they could be. And obviously, when we look at the NAEP data, we see a persistent gap between white kids and black and Hispanic and uh, uh, less advantaged kids and this is something we need to address, certainly in our current national discussion about equity, diversity, and fairness in all things in our society. Changing what we do in education is an act of uh, social justice, I would put it that way. From my point of view, when we talk about the science of reading, what comes to mind for me is the map that was created by Reed Lyon uh, a few years ago. He was the director of reading research at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in the National Institutes of Health. And what he did was depict for us the extent of the research program that has been funded by the National Institutes of Health since uh, 1985, and actually before that on a small scale, at Yale University in the Haskins Labs. But all of these research centers have been working for years. And they have been working with federal funding to depict for us how people learn to read, how the reading brain develops and functions, the differences between good and poor readers that are important for us to understand and the practices that facilitate growth in uh, linguistic awareness, particularly phoneme awareness, but that's not the whole story. Um, how kids learn printed word recognition, how kids develop comprehension of both spoken and written language, and how kids learn to spell and write. And of course, Mark Seidenberg's uh, weighty book, Language at the Speed of Sight, it's probably the best current synthesis of this uh, scientific base that informs our practices. And of course, the simple view of reading is an important framework for understanding what we need to know as practitioners. And it states, as Phil Goff wrote, um, the capacity for reading comprehension, or R, is determined by ability to decode text and ability to comprehend spoken language. And the formula says R equals D times C, meaning reading comprehension is the product of decoding or word recognition and comprehension. And now the Reading League has published a wonderful special issue just come out explaining the ins and outs of both the history of this formula and uh, what it really means for practice. So I recommend that. But fundamental, fundamental to understanding this 
equation is the idea that was developed beginning in the 1970s from the Haskins lab um, that reading is parasitic on language. And what this means is that all of these language structures and dimensions of language processing are uh, uh, something that we need as educators to be very familiar with. And it's impossible to teach reading and writing unless we are comfortable as practitioners with all of these aspects of language. So that is why in the coursework that's being uh, delivered there at Walsh and other good scientifically based programs for teachers, the study of language is fundamental to being a competent practitioner. Uh, research uh, supports the importance of teacher knowledge of language and then of other dimensions of reading development for student outcomes. And how do we know this? There's a robust research base that now has been um, going on for about 25 years. I was kind of the instigator in 1994-95 when I wrote a paper about teacher knowledge and the lack of teacher knowledge in uh, uh, teachers who had been practicing for a long time, as well as those who were new to the profession. So these are the key researchers who have carried on and, and really developed the idea that, that I was advancing a number of years ago. Uh, Shane Piasta is there in Ohio and has done wonderful work showing the relationship between teacher knowledge teacher practice and student outcomes. And it's very important, of course, if we're asking for a change in teacher preparation, that we have a research base for showing why uh, knowledge of language, knowledge of reading psychology, knowledge of scientifically validated practices is important. If we can't show that it affects student outcomes, then we have no argument. But all of these wonderful colleagues of mine over the years have really provided us with a scientific basis for understanding uh, what teachers need to know and why it's important. Uh, it's important also that we recognize as a field that there are a lot of popular ideas and practices that are ubiquitous in our classrooms right now as documented, for example, by an Ed Week survey that was done earlier this year. And uh, what the Ed Week survey was showing us is that disproven ideas, unfortunately, um, not, they're not just neutral, but these are disproven ideas that are still driving instruction in our classrooms and that need to be moved aside in favor of uh, ideas and practices that are supported by science. So what's on the list of disproven ideas? Learning styles, mm -mm. brain-based teaching uh, that comes with computer games. Well, friends, there aren't any learning activities that aren't brain-based. <clears throat> so that's just bogus from the outset. Anything based on three queuing system ideas or frameworks. This uh, three queuing system developed in the 1970s uh, and there just simply is no scientific evidence to support the practices that emanate from three queuing system ideas. And then uh, these practices, these popular programs that are called balanced but that in practice are not balanced because they lack systematic explicit instructional methods and content necessary for building kids uh, phonemic awareness, knowledge and proficiency with phonics and decoding, and also uh, uh, reading comprehension. So the problem is that in our classrooms, these sorts of, uh, th this kind of evidence for uh, faulty thinking about what it means to learn to read are everywhere. And we could, we've been in a lot of classrooms and taken a lot of pictures like this with well-meaning teachers doing what they have been taught, 
uh, earnestly hoping that they're going to be successful. But if the teacher believes that putting words according to their first letter on a word wall and having kids try to remember them by their configuration or outline, or if the teacher believes that color coding is going to be helpful in, in getting kids to be automatic at recogni recognizing words like this, um, the teacher is operating with ideas that, that just simply don't hold up with scientific scrutiny. And um, we need to replace those ideas with better content and more current validated ideas grounded in science. So there's some good news, and that is what's happening at Walsh is actually the trend now. So um, we've seen from an, a National Council of Teacher Quality survey of what's going on in teacher prep, that about half of all teacher prep programs are now introducing candidates to the right stuff, grounded in science, of course, the other half have yet to come along, but this is an improvement. There are now about 10 new introductory textbooks that have come out, uh, reviewed by NCTQ and others, that are available for course instructors to do a better job introducing teachers to the scientific base for what we are going to be successful with. And a number of states have uh, adopted policies and frameworks from the top down that are guiding people to do a better job throughout the university system. Uh, so these are th some of the states that are, that are really doing a better job. So what does it take? I mean, everybody knows that Mississippi uh, statewide uh, was the only state to actually improve on the national assessment of educational progress in fourth grade reading, but what's going on there? It's a combination of things. Um, it's changing instructional practices to align the science. It's adopting programs of instruction that are really well designed to help teachers get results. It's adopting assessments that measure the right stuff in the right way. It's providing teachers with coaching to support them. I'm the first to say that just giving teachers the right information is not sufficient because translating that knowledge into practice is hard and it involves changing a lot of stuff. And, you know, that requires support and collaboration and patience and time and encouragement and um, reinforcement for doing what is going to work best. And of course, once teachers start doing what's going to work best, immediately students respond and it becomes a self-reinforcing process. I mean, there's nothing like seeing your kids do better. And that's what happened with us in the Washington DC um, NICHD funded project that I was accountable for for four years. Uh, the buck stopped with me. We had to show that students in high poverty uh, minority schools could learn to read as well as the national average, and we were able to do that. But what was most thrilling to me was that as a result of the professional development and all of these other things that were happening, the teachers were absolutely thrilled that their students were learning to read sometimes for the first time. So um, that's the whole package there. Of course, keep in mind that what's motivating all of this change process is that much reading failure is unnecessary. And as you get into the research and look at the results that can be obtained when the instruction includes the right stuff done in the right way, that very few kids fail to learn to read adequately. And what happens is the entire distribution of reading skill will move up in a given classroom or school or district or state. And that's what we're striving for. It's not that reading failure will go away altogether because some kids are not wired to do this and will have uh, learning disabilities that 
need treatment over a long period of time. But in the main, we can expect that most kids can learn and most kids will learn and most uh, classrooms can achieve a much better result. One of the best reference points for understanding what should be done is the Knowledge and Practice Standards for Teachers of Reading, published by the International Dyslexia Association. But when I worked on those standards and led the committee, we very deliberately uh, designed them to be for all teachers of reading, not just for teachers who work with students who are classified as being dyslexic. This is not a dyslexia initiative. This is a reading initiative, and there is a test, uh, the K-PERI, that is aligned with these standards that measure uh, teacher knowledge in relation to these standards. So I want to thank you. I want to encourage you. I, I want you to know that I and many other policymakers know that great teachers are our most precious resource. We cannot achieve these results without you all who are endeavoring to improve uh, the results that we get in schools. And that starts with teacher education. So good for all of you and carry on and, and pick up this banner. You are going to be trendsetters. And thanks a lot.